he's not uh, internet savvy or, or social media savvy, and I'm just not savvy. So there you go. Uh, hey, uh, Cork Smalley, 90 years old, and his wife Barb, she's not as old as he is, but she's left, and they're a beautiful family, and they have a visitation tomorrow here. I think it's like 11 to 1 or 10 to 1, 11 to 1, and the funeral's at 1, so just want to make you aware. Well, because Jesus is alive, we too shall live. Be he lives, he lives, right? He is alive. And I live, I live, because he is risen. I live, I live with power over sin. I live, I live, because he is risen. I live, I live, to worship him. Can you say that? Amen. Y'all, y'all. Can you just write Pastor Brett letters and tell him that I ought to be doing solos? I'd appreciate it. Um, you see, when the Holy Spirit comes in, he makes you alive. Uh, we can believe the facts of this book, but it doesn't save us. It's the power of the Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead comes in and raises you from the dead and makes your heart new and makes you alive in Christ. It's a powerful thing, the grace of God, the power of God, the Spirit of God. You know, I, I will tell you that both Christmas and Easter has roots in it that are rotten. But today, we know the truth about Jesus, born of a virgin, living a sinless life. You know, um, and the fact that he went on the cross and died for us, right? And he paid the penalty that I should have paid for my own sin. And he was buried, and for three days he was buried, but he rose again, and he lives forevermore. And he told us he would rise again. Guess what he else told us? He told us he's coming again. And just like he rose, he's going to come back. You believe that? Someday Jesus is coming back. I can tell you. Today's message is called Jesus is Risen, and he is risen indeed. Uh, 1 Corinthians, we're going to turn to chapter 15. That's the resurrection chapter. So turn in your Bibles uh, to 1 Corinthians 15. Turn in your mobile device. You can use uh, uh, gateway, uh, BibleGateway.com. Use your mobile device if you want to. It's okay to read the Bible from a mobile device. But the scriptures make it clear that it is not okay to tweet in church. Just so, you, in case you had any question. But you can read the Bible on your mobile device. So pay attention as we look. A little background on this passage. Corinthians, the church at Corinth, they were, uh, they were in the Gnosticism, so they had been Gnostics, and that's their background, which Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosko, which means to know, and the uh, Corinthians worshipped knowledge, and they did not, they, oh, they also came from uh, a, a, a Greek mythology background, and because of that, they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. In fact, one little thing I haven't told the other services, and that is this, is that they would say, well, if Jesus was God, God can't die. So they denied the humanity when Jesus left heaven, and he took up on form of a servant and became a man. So they just didn't believe Jesus died. So they had problems, and Paul is addressing this problem, and he's talking to them, and Paul, in this passage we're going to read, he in no way is he trying to convince them that Jesus rose from the dead. Today, we try to convince people, Jesus really did rise from the dead. Everybody knew it. It was a known fact. He didn't need to convince them. They knew he rose from the dead. In this particular case, he's writing to say there is a bodily resurrection of, of the believer that dies. You've got people that have died in Christ. They're your loved ones. Their body's going to come up out of that grave. Ain't no grave going to hold this body down. Ain't no grave going to hold this body down. That's right. And you're living when that trumpet sounds and Christ calls and you're alive and you're following Jesus, you're going to fly away just like the song said, in a moment twinkling of an eye, boom, from heaven to earth, join with those that are dead in the grave to be with the Lord forever, wherefore comfort one another with these words is what the scripture says. Now, even though 
the Corinthians are, they, that they, you know, they, they believed in eternal life. They just didn't believe in this bodily resurrection. So get a hold of that. This is what Paul is addressing as we read. You need to understand that. He says this in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 15, which is the resurrection chapter. And it talks about a terrestrial body. It talks about a celestial body, an earthly body, a heavenly body. Read it, 1 Corinthians 15, this week sometime. Verse 12, we're picking up. Now, if Christ is preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some of among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Verse 17 says this, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. Your faith is futile if he's not risen. You are still in your sins. That's not good news. Verse 18 says, then also those who have fallen asleep, or in other words, have died in Christ, have perished. They're gone. It's over. Obviously, we know that Jesus rose from the dead. The scripture makes it plain. But what's interesting is Paul is using the bodily resurrection of Jesus as proof that we too, as believers, when we're buried, will rise and have a bodily resurrection. You see, Jesus had, after the resurrection, for 40 days, he appeared to people. Okay, they touched him. He said, Thomas, touch my hand, look at my side. Uh, when, when the women came to him and as they were going to tell the disciples that he was alive, you'll see later we read, they grabbed a hold of his feet and worshiped him. He had a physical body, he ate, he spoke to them. He had a physical body, but he also had a heavenly body. Yeah, a spiritual body. In fact, the disciples are a little bit fearful after Jesus had been put to death on the cross, they were hiding behind locked doors. The doors were locked, right? And Jesus went right through and appeared to them. So I just got news for you. When we all get to heaven, and it ain't gonna be Hotel California. It's gonna be heaven where the streets are gold. So tell the eagles, it's not Hotel California. Okay? When we get to heaven, guess what? I'm going to walk right through the walls. You can lock your doors all you want, and I'm coming in. So just get ready. Yeah, you remember that now. <laughs> so, so the reason that Paul doesn't try to prove that Jesus is risen from the dead is because everybody knew it. And the rabbis even knew it. In rabbinical literature, you'll see that they're trying to explain away because they couldn't deny the resurrection of Jesus. It was such a known fact. So they would say, and, and, and you can read... Uh, Josephus, you can read Pliny, you can read a number of uh, Eusebius, you can read a number of other historians, you can read the rabbinical writings, it's documented well. And many times, here's what they say, well, one of, some of the things that they would say is this, they would say, uh, well, when he was in Egypt, he learned magic power and he raised himself from the dead. And can you believe they would come up with that? I mean, here's the deal, we know the date that uh, uh, the crazy man they was wanting to put him to death, uh, was, went and died. We know. We have it recorded in history. We know when he died. What was his name? My mind is blank as can be. Herod. Yes, Herod. We know when he died. And Jesus had gone, they'd gone off to Egypt, remember? And so there is no doubt. He was, Jesus couldn't have been more than four years old. How ludicrous of a story to write in history, accusing Jesus from magic he learned by the time he was four, that he could raise himself from the dead. And another one they say, and they accused him of the miracles he did, that he did it by the power of Beelzebub or by the devil. And so also historians write that he used inappropriately the name of Yahweh to, and says, cursed is the man that uses the name of Yahweh to raise himself from the dead. And over and over. Because, listen guys, there was no doubt in that time that Jesus rose from the dead. It was an absolute fact. No one could deny it. And so we pick back up to 1 Corinthians 15, 3. In verse 1, he talks about the gospel. Here's the gospel. Jesus died, was buried, he rose again. Three undeniable facts. He died, he was buried, he rose again. And in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 15, it says, I, For I delivered to you first of all. First of all could be of first importance. In theology, it's called the law of first importance. It's the most central truth in the scripture. If Jesus is dead, Paul says, your faith is vain, and there's no hope. The only hope is in the resurrection of Jesus, because if he's dead, we all die, and we're done. 
right? So the resurrection of Jesus is central to our faith, the most important truth of our faith in Jesus Christ. So he says, I delivered you, first of all, that which I also received. Number one, Christ died for our sins. When he died, he didn't just die, he died for our sins. He paid my penalty for my sin. I should have been crucified. I should have died. My blood should have been shed for my own sins, but Jesus took my place. He died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried. And that's the second thing, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And look at this, that he was seen by Cephas. Cephas is Aramaic for Peter. The Greek is Peter. Okay, remember he was the one that was afraid and he denied Christ and he was hiding and cursed and said, I don't even know him. Get away from me, leave me alone. Big sissy old Peter. But after he saw him risen from the dead, he became mighty Peter and the Holy Spirit visited him and he preached. And what did he preach all through Acts? What did they preach? The resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of Christ in the face of a culture that doesn't believe it. They preached Jesus risen from the dead, crucified on the cross, buried and risen from the dead. The gospel, they preached it and it's powerful. And so he was seen by Cephas. And then by the 12, and that's the replacement of Judas, so if you're concerned because Judas wasn't there, but the, but the disciple that replaced him saw him alive. And after that, he was seen by 500 brethren at once. In other words, the same time, there were 500 people that saw him. And then he goes on and he says, of whom the greater part remain of this present. What is he saying? He's saying 500 people saw him together and most of them are still alive. Go ask them. Undeniable. He's just pointing it out. Jesus is alive. Undeniable. And then look at the next one. And he says, well then, and it says, but some have fallen asleep. And after that, he said, he was seen by James. Which James is this? This is the brother of Jesus. Why is that important? You study the life of James and you have enough proof right in him alone that Jesus rose from the dead. I want to give you a scripture I want you to look up. Mark it down. Even you Bible theologians don't know that this is here. Mark 3, 21. Mark 3, 21. The crowd was pushing in on Jesus. And the Bible records that his family come to get him and take Jesus away because they thought he was not right in his head. He was, something was wrong with him. I mean, after all, if you're the brother, sisters of Jesus, and he's claimed to be and acts like that, they're going to take him away. It is clear in history James did not believe in his brother Jesus at all, right? That's why he's listed here. James saw him alive. And later in history, you know, I don't remember exactly, I think it's about 80, 80, 49, something, I don't remember exactly, but it's recorded in multiple places as well as scripture that James is the head of the church. He's the guy, he wrote the book of James in the New Testament, the brother of Jesus, right? And that he's the head of the church. And then this Christianity, listen, if Jesus was dead, how can a dead man that was crucified spread so fast and have so many followers that were willing to die? Saul himself. And it goes on, it says, and I saw him too. Like the next verse says, I, Saul, Saul says, or Paul says, I saw him, not in due time. But, you know, and, and here he is the one putting people to death for being followers of Jesus because they thought it was blasphemous. But when Saul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, his life was changed and he became a martyr. The disciples became martyrs. And Jesus turned and he was the head of the church and the history historians in multiple places record that this thing about Jesus was going so crazy that the religious leaders, because he was ahead of that sect of Judaism, the, the Christian sect, they told him, you get up on top of that, that pinnacle, you get up on top of the wall of the Temple Mount, you stand up there and you tell those people, Jesus is not risen from the dead, he is not the Messiah, and to stop all this madness. And instead, the, the history records with a loud voice, he gets up and declares Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the righteous one, the holy one of Israel, God Almighty. And they came, they were so angry, they pushed him off, he fell, I've been there, I've watched it, I've stood right where it was, I've looked at the, and there's where he landed. And they finished him off, and James died. But before they did, they said, whoa, he's saying something. And he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do just like Stephen when he was stoned, just like Jesus on the cross. James saw him alive, it changed him, folks. It changed him. And then by the apostles, apostles in verse eight, then last of all, he was seen by also, seen by me also, born out of due time. And of course, speaking of his road to Damascus, appearance where Jesus came to him. There's no doubt Jesus rose from the dead. Scripture, medical science, his death, 
His burial, his resurrection, medical science, scripture, history, ancient literature all prove without of a doubt the fact that Jesus died, he was crucified, he was buried, and he raised from the dead. He was risen from the dead. And it's the good news that was preached, and that's the good news we have today. The first thing we see, number one of these indisputable facts is Jesus, he died. Turn to John 19, okay? Now, if you, you know, you can go online and listen to this again, but let me just tell you, I'm giving you enough st stuff here. This, I'm gonna give you enough stuff, but at the end of this thing, listen to me, now care carefully, you don't have to have faith to believe it. You just do the research, just like you believe in Nero, just like you believe in Alexander the Great, just like you believe in any other historical fact, there's history upon history upon history, extra biblical, ancient literature, proving the facts are, if you want, the only reason people don't want to look is because they don't want authority over them. They don't want to surrender to a God in God's ways. The Bible says our, our, our God's ways are not our ways, and the, a way that seems right to man leads to destruction. So you can think all you want about what you think, but God's not impressed by what you think. He said what he thinks, and he makes it clear, and he doesn't change his mind. And so I'm just telling you, this book, mark it down. You're going you're gonna to see John chapter 19, verse 31 to 34. Follow with me. He died. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day or a holy day, the Jews asked Pilate, that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. In other words, the next day is the Sabbath. They don't want the criminals on the cross on the Sabbath. They said, break their legs so they go ahead and die, and we can get them off the cross before the Sabbath. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him, the two thieves. They broke their legs, and then they died. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. He was already dead. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And then look down at verse 36, John 19. For those things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. There is no doubt at all that Jesus Christ died on that cross. In March 21, 1986, the Journal of American Medical Association came out with a story in their magazine, that March 21, 1986 edition. I've got a copy of it. You can find it if you go to godandscience.org, godandscience.org, and put, the put in their Journal of America, J-A-M-A, -A, Journal of American Association, uh, March 21, 1986, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I mean the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is the article. And in that, they use scripture, but they also use historical documents from the time and modern medical science to verify what the Bible record is and what the historical record is, whether it's accurate about his dying on the cross. They do that study to see what happened, and you'll see uh, how they were crucifying at the time Jesus uh, died on the cross. And this is all unquestionable in a historical record, and you can find it in that edition uh, how the Romans did crucifixion. So I have a picture from that article with the spike in the wrist of Jesus. I want to explain something to you. 30 years before Jesus died, there were a few of the thieves or criminals that escaped from the cross. They used to put the spike in the hand. And as they were on, with their, on their hands, they would begin, the cartilage wasn't, it wasn't strong enough to hold it tight like it should. And, the, the, you know, and it started, it would push up and break and, and the hole would get bigger. And somehow they'd get their hands free. And they had a few friends that were bandits and they were only watching the criminals with two or three soldiers. So, you know, I mean, they're on the cross, right? And so they came and they helped the bandits, I mean, helped their criminal friends get off the cross, knock down the soldiers, and they would escape. And it happened several times, recorded in history, okay? So 30 years later, by then, when Jesus is crucified, they do it differently. They don't put it in the hands anymore. They put it in the wrist. It's still a part of the hand. And you can see there's a soft spot in your hand. And they put the spike right in there. You can see that. And when they did, it would go right between two bones. No bones were broken. It didn't hit a main artery. They didn't bleed to death because part of this was to, to, to make them uh, suffer when they died. They were experts on suffering. And that, that's what they were doing. They were punishing them with suffering. So they didn't want them to die right away. And uh, they didn't break any bones. The blood didn't bleed. And, and second, but it did sever the nerve right there. And you can see the hands curled. 
and the nerve, the nerve, and it talks about it, the nerve is severed and excruciating pain would run up the arms and across the shoulder. And they would be lay, sitting there on three points, the feet and two hands, and having to get breath by pulling up and pushing up, and it was painful. By the way, the word excruciating, we get a lot of our words from the Greek to, to the Latin, and the word excruciating, that word has the word cruci in it, C-R-U-C-I, and that's where we get the word excruciating from crucify, because it was so excruciating. Interesting, huh? They were punishing them, they were hurting them. And uh, also at that time, uh, they didn't have many guards, remember they were getting off, and so when Jesus was crucified, a garrison is a hundred soldiers, a centurion, the word sent means 100, the centurion was the leader of a hundred soldiers, and the centurion, you remember the centurion, the Bible records that he bowed down and says, truly, this is the Son of God. After all the crucifixion and all the, uh, the earthquake and everything that happened on the cross, remember that? He confessed Jesus as Lord, the centurion, the head of, the, of that garrison of the 100 soldiers. There was no way Jesus was going to get out of there. I mean, they had him on that cross, and they had enough soldiers. Nobody was going to take that body, and he died on that cross. The second picture is a picture of the feet on the cross. Not only a spike to the hands, but through the feet. And, and, and 30 years before, when they were starting to get off, the, and you'll see this depicted in a lot of the crosses, they'd build a little platform on the, the down beam. And they would put their feet on top of the platform like this and drill the spike down through. But at the time Jesus was crucified, they bent the knee, and they put the spike straight into the down beam, the up and down beam. They spiked him straight in, put the right foot over the left foot, and if you'll notice, and this talks about it in the medical journal here, that, they, that in the soft spot on the feet, you have that too, that that spike would go right between the bones. It didn't break any bones, didn't make them bleed, and it was insecurely, and they couldn't get their feet off, okay? And so that, that's, that's important to understand that. And, uh, and then and you go, and, and, and by the way, the reason they would break their legs so they'd go ahead and die, people would stay, it's recorded often, two, three days on the cross being crucified. Even reports of people four days on that cross, four days being crucified. Believe that? So that's why they broke the legs, because it's Sabbath day, they, they wanted them to, to die, and they would suffocate after the legs were broken. The next picture from the, from the journal is, the piercing of the side. The record says in, 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 in the med medical proof of the American Medical Association, that journal, that article, it says that when blood and water came out, it was proof that he was dead already. Absolute proof. And because blood and water, they know that they pierced him on the right side. They went through the lung into the heart. And secondly, because of how the blood and water came out, he died of a burst heart. His heart burst. Let me say it a different way. His heart was broken. Jesus said, no man will take my life from me. I willingly lay my life down. And the Bible records that he cries out and he gives up the ghost. He breathes his last as if Jesus chooses the time and the moment. Because it was so unprecedented for him when they came to break the legs that he was already dead and they had to break both of the other's legs, but not Jesus. Again, if you just want proof, the fact that there's a re historical record they didn't break, is a, that was prophesied that the Messiah, they'd have no broken bones and that they would look upon the one they pierced. It's just like the scripture we read. So, number one, he died. Number two, he was buried. We'll turn to Matthew 27. There will also be in Matthew 28. So get your Bibles open. Use your little, little device there, you wizards. Matthew's the first book. In the New Testament, the gospel book, telling about the life of Jesus Christ, his death and burial, the resurrection. Verse 62, Matthew 27, on the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver, talking to Jesus, said, after three days I will rise. Notice who it is. It's the Pharisees, it's the chief priests, the Pharisees, it's the religious leaders, the ones that got him on the cross and lied and everything else and manipulated, did it all during the night. They remembered that deceiver, they call him, after three days said, I'm gonna rise. Therefore, command the tomb to be secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he's risen from the dead. So then the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, 
said to these Pharisees, these chief priests, he said, you have a guard. Now I want to stop. He says, you have a guard. The guard didn't mean a guard. It means a company, a guard, lots of soldiers. That's what it means. And you'll see it in a minute when I keep reading that I'm right. You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. It's interesting how the religious people there, the scribes, the Pharisees, the chief priests, how they remembered what Jesus said about the third day, but his followers didn't remember. And I'll guarantee you, they didn't want somebody stealing that body and saying he rose from the dead. And when they sealed that tomb, they did a good job. They, they did it with mortar. And I mean, they sealed that tomb good and they had guards there and there was no way. That'd be the worst thing that could happen to have someone take that body away. He was buried, he was inside that. And uh, it's interesting that we as followers sometimes, you know, like <laughs> when they came, you know, the women came to the tomb, they had spices, they were gonna prepare his body. They hadn't prepared his body yet for burial. But the spice, remember that? They didn't come expecting to see him out of the grave and the grave empty and him rising from the dead like he said. They came because he knew he was dead, right? It's like, it's like sometimes we just don't believe what he says because it's too, too, too stupendous. It's too spiritual, too, too uh, miraculous. He said, I'm gonna rise. They just didn't believe it. He was with them. They saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. What's wrong with them? Why didn't they believe it? Let me ask you a question. Acts 1 says, Jesus ascended into heaven on a cloud and this 120 plus was watching him ascend into heaven. They saw him go. And the angel appeared and said, this same Jesus you see going up in the clouds is gonna come again in like manner someday. And yet we preach Jesus is coming back, live like it. And we live like he's never gonna come. We do our own thing. We're not too concerned because he says, the night comes when no man can work. The end's gonna be here. And I'm telling you, Jesus could come anytime. Do you really believe it? Or are you like the followers of Jesus then that didn't believe he would actually rise from the dead? But he did. And just like he rose, he's gonna come. You better get things right with God and live right with God. He definitely was buried. You know, being buried has a lot to do with the Christian life. We have a, a ceremony or we have a, something we do that's very spiritual that is like burying, and that's water baptism. Romans 6, 4 talks about it. He says, therefore, we're buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. See, Jesus is the one that said, repent and be baptized. And as followers of Jesus, we need to be baptized in water because Jesus commanded it. It's a picture of us dying to ourselves, saying no to our will, uh, laying down the past, our, our, our guilt, our shame, all the sin, and being free and raising up to new life by the Spirit of God to live in us, to go forward and be overcomers. And we have a, a baptism service coming up the first Sunday night of May, May 6th at 6 p.m., and you can sign up online for it. And, if, and here's the thing, I'm calling men, I'm calling families, I'm calling individuals to step up and go all the way with Jesus and make it public. This private, I don't tell anybody I'm a full follower of Jesus, doesn't work. Jesus said, be baptized. Be public. He said, if you don't confess me before men, I won't confess you before my Father. We need to go public. And I'm telling you, you need to give your life to Christ if you haven't and become serious about daily following Jesus Christ and serving him as your Lord. He died, he was buried, and we need to be buried with him and lay down our life. Say, not my will, but God, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The third thing, he rose from the dead. He's risen. Matthew 28, picking up verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. I love that. He sat there. You want some of this? Come on, boy. <laughs> Boom, earthquake. <laughs> Roll it back. <laughs> Sitting there. I love that. And the guards shook for fear of him. I don't blame them. They became like dead men. I don't know. Some theologians think they were slain in spirit. I don't know about that. I'm not sure that's right. I, I think, you know, being a Texan and everything, I, I think personally when they saw all that, they just thought, they, so fret, they just played possum, you know. <laughs> Just act like they're dead. They just played dead. That was it. Maybe not. 
This is my interpretation. I think they were so fearful they just fell over. But the angel answered and said to the woman, to the women he said, do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, he's risen. As he said, you know, it's like, I told you so, he told you, he said it. Come see the place where he Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead and indeed he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I've told you. So they went out, the women went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. And as they, as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Now, while they were going, behold, look at this, some of the guard, some of the soldiers, not all of them, there was a lot of them, but some of them came into the city and reported to the chief priest. They're the ones that asked them to, you know, said they're gonna steal his body, you better, you know, seal up that tomb and put the guard there, you know. And, and they, so they came to tell the chief priest all the things that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they got together and huddled and said, what are we gonna do? This is terrible. They're gonna say, Russell the dead, what's going on? They came up with a plan. Always the plan when you're in trouble lie. They consulted together. They gave a large sum of money. They bribed them to the soldiers saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, in other words, you could get in trouble there, right? You know, oh, we will pay him off too, or we will appease him and make you secure. Don't worry. It's okay to lie. If you get in trouble for it, we'll bribe them and pay them so you don't get in trouble. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day, as he's writing to the Corinthians, I mean, right, as Matthew's writing this gospel. In other words, all the Jews, all the Israelites knew the guards lied. They knew the story because everybody, it was a known fact, everybody knew Jesus really rose from the dead and they were on to him. And Matthew's saying, he's saying, hey guys, Everybody knows you're lying. Everybody knows you lied. He's writing about it. He says, and they still know it today. They know that Jesus actually rose and that the lie that we stole him is wrong. You know it, everybody knows it. Nobody stole that body. Jesus rose from the dead. And it's documented in history multiple times about the bribing of the guards and the lie that also documents the fact that they lied and that that's a true story, not just in the Bible, but they lied through their teeth to, so to keep them from knowing Jesus was alive. Hallelujah, that's awesome, isn't it? Jesus is alive. Did you know that if Jesus is not risen, if he's still dead, we have no hope? I mean, we're done. When we, when we die, we know there's no hope without Jesus, outside of Jesus. He's the only God, the only deity that's alive, that's risen from the dead, that conquered death, hell, and the grave. And you know that hope has a name? The only name by which a man can be saved, and that name is Jesus. Hope has a name, it's Jesus. I wanna ask you, do you believe yourself that God raised Jesus from the dead? How many of you believe God raised Jesus from the dead? You believe it? Did you know that it's impossible to be saved? It's impossible to be saved and have your sins forgiven and be a Christian and be a follower of Jesus, truly accepted by God, unless you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. You have to believe that. The Bible says so, Romans 10, 9. Look at the scripture, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that's mean that you don't just give lip service and believe the story, but you make him your ruler, your Lord. You say, your will, not my will, Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart. In other words, truly believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess Jesus as your Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And I'm challenging you today, all of you, to go all the way with Jesus, make him Lord. Don't stop short. Go public. I'm challenging, men, I'm challenging men to rise up and be leaders and say, as Joshua of old, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, many men go to church to appease their wife. Many men want to stay in their seat to get saved or be a nominal Christian or believe it, but not be fully devoted. And they don't want lots of people they know to know. And when I say to men, you, you need to come and publicly declare Jesus as your Savior and Lord, they don't want to do it. But Jesus says, again, I said, says, if you won't confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father in heaven. One of the most moving moments in my ministry, I remember coming down the aisle. I wasn't the preacher. I didn't preach hardly ever. 
this huge guy, he was about 6'7", he probably weighed 350. And he come down, he had big old long legs. He's walking down that aisle. Right behind him is his elementary boy. He's got short legs, but he's trying to follow the same stride. And he's stepping as long as he can, following his dad to that altar to give his life to Jesus. Grandfather, dad, if you want your grandchildren, you want your children to be a follower of Jesus, you got to make a declaration. You got to go public. You got to go all in. Make a public commitment, confession to Jesus. And I'm challenging men to go all in for Jesus. It's important to take that public stand. So I'm asking you, will you today totally surrender to Jesus the Lord? Confess to all people with your mouth that God has raised him from the dead and that he's your Lord. Will you let Jesus, the risen Lord, be your personal Lord and Savior? Will you submit yourself, if you haven't been baptized in water, to obey Jesus, to repent and be baptized? I want you to bow your head with me and close your eyes. I want to help you come to Jesus. I want to help you by leading in a prayer. See, if you'll confess Jesus as your Lord, believe God raised him from the dead, he will save you today. If you want to give your life to Jesus, then all you need to do is just pray it in your heart. Just mean it. I'm asking you just pray it and mean it in your heart. And then in a moment, maybe find someone you could just confess to one person, hey, I prayed today and I meant it, and I meant business with God. So just from your heart, just say this, and, uh, you, and just pray, just pray this. Dear God, will you, forgive me of my, will you forgive me for all my sins? Will you forgive me? Just say it, just ask him, just ask him that. Dear God, forgive me of all my sins. And Jesus, come into my life today and be my Lord and Savior. Just ask him, come into my life. Be my Lord, be my Savior. And just tell him, thank you, Jesus, for saving me today and forgiving my sins. I want to be a follower of you every day. Now, nobody's looking around. I want to know how many of you will say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer just now, and I really meant business with God. Just put your hand up and put it way up high because it's the best decision you ever did. Yes, I see hands everywhere. Hold it right up there. You meant it. There's lots of hands up. That's good. That's good. And we ought to rejoice for that. It's good. It's good. I remember when I did this, when I came, and the Holy Spirit just touched me. I mean, he, he made, it, made, made God real to me. Now I'm asking you to take, do one more thing. You ought to be so proud of it. It's the best decision you ever made. I'm asking you to do something else. I'm asking you, as the congregation stands in a minute, to get up out of your seat, walk down this aisle, and go public. Because many have. And it's not embarrassing. It's the best thing. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's a rejoice. It's something you should be proud of. You've made the prayer. You've given your life to Jesus. You're going to heaven. We're the, we're the eternal family of God in heaven. So would you stand with me? And I'm asking you right now as we stand. Everybody stand. All the, as we sing it, would you come right now?